Battle of Dunkirk. The Battle of Dunkirk took place in Dunkirk, France, during the Second World War between the Allies and Nazi Germany. As part of the Battle of France on the Western Front, the Battle of Dunkirk was the defense and evacuation of British and Allied forces in Europe from 26 May to 4 June 1940. After the Phony War, the Battle of France began in earnest on 10 May 1940. To the east, the German Army Group B invaded the Netherlands and advanced westward. In response, the Supreme Allied Commander, French General Maurice Gamelin, initiated, Plan D and entered Belgium to engage the Germans in the Netherlands. The plan relied heavily on the Maginot Line fortifications along the German-French border. But German forces had already crossed through most of the Netherlands before the French forces arrived. Gamelin instead committed the forces under his command, three mechanized armies, the French 1st and 7th Armies and the British Expeditionary Force to the River Dial. On 14 May, German Army Group A burst through the Ardennes and advanced rapidly to the west towards Sedan, then turned northward to the English Channel, in what General Feldmarschall Eric von Manstein called the Sickle Cut, effectively flanking the Allied forces. A series of Allied counterattacks, including the Battle of Arras, failed to sever the German spearhead, which reached the coast on 20 May, separating the British Expeditionary Force near Armatiers, the French First Army, and the Belgian Army further to the north from the majority of French troops south of the German penetration. After reaching the Channel, the German forces swung north along the coast, threatening to capture the ports and trap the British and French forces before they could evacuate to Britain. In one of the most widely debated decisions of the war, the Germans halted their advance on Dunkirk. Contrary to popular belief, what became known as the Halt Order did not originate with Adolf Hitler. Field Marshals Gerd von Rundstedt and Gunther von Kluger suggested that the German forces around the Dunkirk pocket should cease their advance on the port and consolidate to avoid an Allied breakout. Hitler sanctioned the order on 24 May with the support of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht. The army was to halt for three days, which gave the Allies sufficient time to organize the Dunkirk evacuation and build a defensive line. Despite the Allies' gloomy estimates of the situation, with Britain even discussing a conditional surrender to Germany, in the end more than 330,000 Allied troops were rescued. Prelude On 10 May 1940, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. By 26 May, the BEF and the French First Army were bottled up in a corridor to the sea, about deep and wide. Most of the British forces were still around Lille, over from Dunkirk, with the French further south. Two massive German armies flanked them. General Feder von Bock's Army Group B was to the east, and General Gerd von Rundstedt's Army Group A to the west. Halt Order Quotes on the Halt Order, Major L.F. Ellis wrote, The day's entry concludes with the remark, The task of Army Group A can be considered to have been completed in the main, a view which further explains Rundstedt's reluctance to employ his armoured divisions in the final clearing-up stage of this first phase of the campaign. Halder wrote in his diary on 30 May, Brouch each is angry. The pocket would have been closed at the coast if only our armour had not been held back. The bad weather has grounded the Luftwaffe and we must now stand and watch countless thousands of the enemy get away to England right under our noses. On 24 May, Hitler had visited General von Rundstedt's headquarters at Charleville. 
Von Rundstedt advised him the infantry should attack the British forces at Arras, where the British had proved capable of significant action, while Kleist's armour held the line west and south of Dunkirk to pounce on the Allied forces retreating before Army Group B. This order allowed the Germans to consolidate their gains and prepare for a southward advance against the remaining French forces. The terrain around Dunkirk was thought unsuitable for armour. Hitler was familiar with Flanders' marshes from the First World War. Although his pilots had fought for two consecutive weeks, they were aided by synthetic methamphetamine. And Luftwaffe commander Hermann Göring asked for the chance to destroy the forces in Dunkirk. The Allied forces' destruction was thus initially assigned to the Air Force and the German infantry organized in Army Group B. Von Rundstedt later called this one of the great turning points of the war. The true reason for the decision to halt the German armor on 24 May is still debated. One theory is that von Rundstedt and Hitler agreed to conserve the armor for fall rot, an operation to the south. It is possible that the Luftwaffe's closer ties than the armies to the Nazi party contributed to Hitler's approval of Göring's request. Another theory, which few historians have given credence, is that Hitler was still trying to establish diplomatic peace with Britain before Operation Barbarossa. Although von Rundstedt after the war stated his suspicions that Hitler wanted to help the British based on alleged praise of the British Empire during a visit to his headquarters. No evidence exists that Hitler wanted to let the Allies escape. The historian Brian Bond stated, Few historians now accept the view that Hitler's behavior was influenced by the desire to let the British off lightly in the hope that they would then accept a compromise peace. True. In his political testament dated 26 February 1945 Hitler lamented that Churchill was quite unable to appreciate the sporting spirit in which he had refrained from annihilating the British expeditionary force at Dunkirk, but this hardly squares with the contemporary record. Directive No. 13 issued by the Supreme Headquarters on 24 May called specifically for the annihilation of the French, English and Belgian forces in the pocket while the Luftwaffe was ordered to prevent the escape of the English forces across the Channel. Whatever the reasons for Hitler's decision, the Germans confidently believed the Allied troops were doomed. American journalist William Shira reported on 25 May German military circles here tonight put it flatly. They said the fate of the great Allied army bottled up in Flanders is sealed. BEF Commander Lord Gort agreed, writing to Anthony Eden, I must not conceal from you that a great part of the BEF and its equipment will inevitably be lost in the best of circumstances. Hitler did not rescind the halt order until the evening of 26 May. The three days thus gained gave a vital breathing space to the Royal Navy to arrange the evacuation of the British and Allied troops. About 338,000 men were rescued in about 11 days. Of these some 215,000 were British and 123,000 were French, of whom 102,250 escaped in British ships. Fight back to the West On 26 May, Antony Eden told General Lord Gort, commander-in-chief of the BEF, that he might need to fight back to the West, and ordered him to prepare plans for the evacuation, but without telling the French or the Belgians. Galt replied, I must not conceal from you a great part of the BEF, and its equipment will inevitably be lost. He had foreseen the order, and preliminary plans were already in hand. The first such plan, for a defense along the Lys Canal, could not be carried out, because of German advances on 26 May. 
with 2nd and 50th Divisions pinned down, and 1st, 5th and 48th Divisions under heavy attack. The 2nd Division took heavy casualties trying to keep a corridor open, being reduced to brigade strength, but they succeeded. 1st, 3rd, 4th, and 42nd Divisions escaped along the corridor that day, as did about one-third of the French 1st Army. As the Allies fell back, they disabled their artillery and vehicles and destroyed their stores. On 27 May, the British fought back to the Dunkirk perimeter line. The Le Paradis massacre took place at day, when the 3. SS Division Tokhenkov machine-gunned 97 British and French prisoners near the Le Basse Canal. The British prisoners were from the 2nd Battalion, Royal Norfolk Regiment, part of the 4th Brigade of the 2nd Division. The SS men lined them up against the wall of a barn and shot them all. Only two survived. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe dropped bombs and leaflets on the Allied armies. The leaflets showed a map of the situation. They read, in English and French British soldiers, look, at the map, it gives your true situation. Your troops are entirely surrounded. Stop fighting. Put down your arms. To the land and air-minded Germans, the sea seemed an impassable barrier. So they believed the Allies were surrounded, but the British saw the sea as a route to safety, as well as the Luftwaffe's bombs. German heavy artillery also fired high-explosive shells into Dunkirk. By this time, the town contained the bodies of over 1,000 civilian casualties. This bombardment continued until the evacuation was over. Battle of Whiteskeet Gort had sent Lieutenant General Ronald Adam, commanding 3rd Corps, ahead to build the defensive perimeter around Dunkirk. Lieutenant General Alan Brooke, commanding 2nd Corps, was to conduct a holding action with the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 50th Divisions along the Ypres Comines Canal as far as YSER, while the rest of the BEF fell back. The Battle of Whiteskeet, over the border in Belgium, was the toughest action Brooke faced in this role. On 26 May, the Germans made a reconnaissance in force against the British position. At midday on 27 May, they launched a full-scale attack with three divisions south of Ypres. A confused battle followed, where visibility was low because of forested or urban terrain, and communications were poor, because the British at that time used no radios below battalion level, and the telephone wires had been cut. The Germans used infiltration tactics to get among the British who were beaten back. The heaviest fighting was in the 5th Division sector. Still on 27 May, Brooke ordered the 3rd Division commander, Major General Bernard Montgomery, to extend his division's line to the left thereby freeing the 10th and 11th Brigades, both of the 4th Division, to join the 5th Division at Messine Ridge. The 10th Brigade arrived first to find the enemy had advanced so far they were closing on the British field artillery. Between them, the 10th and 11th Brigades cleared the ridge of Germans, and by 28 May they were securely dug in east of Whiteskeet. That day, Brooke ordered a counter-attack. This was to be spearheaded by two battalions, the 3rd Grenadier Guards and 2nd North Staffordshire Regiment both of Major General Harold Alexander's 1st Division. The North Staffords advanced as far as the Courtgear River, while the Grenadiers reached the canal itself, but could not hold it. The counterattack's effect was to disrupt the Germans, holding them back a little longer while the BEF retreated. Action at Popierringe the route back from Brooks' position to Dunkirk passed through the town of Popierringe, where there was a bottleneck at a bridge over the YSCR canal. Most of the main roads in the area converged on that bridge. On 27 May, 
The Luftwaffe bombed the resulting traffic jam thoroughly for two hours, destroying or immobilizing about 80% of the vehicles. Another Luftwaffe raid, on the night of 28-29 May, was illuminated by flares as well as the light from burning vehicles. The British 44th Division in particular had to abandon many guns and lorries, losing almost all of them between Poperinge and the Mont. The German 6. Panzer Division could probably have destroyed 44th Division at Poperinge on 29 May, thereby cutting off the 3rd and 50th Divisions as well. The historian and author Julian Thompson calls it astonishing that they did not, but they were distracted, investing the nearby town of Kassel. Belgian surrender Gort had ordered Lieutenant General Adam, commanding 3rd Corps, and French General Fagold, to prepare a perimeter defense of Dunkirk. The perimeter was semicircular, with French troops manning the western sector and British troops the eastern. It ran along the Belgian coastline from Newport in the east via Ferns, Bolskamp and Bergs to grave lines in the west. The line was as strong as it could be made under the circumstances. But on 28 May the Belgian army, who were largely outnumbered by the attacking Germans, and still under the direct command of King Leopold, who had refused to abandon his troops, and the Belgian refugees inside the little enclave of what remained of unoccupied Belgium, surrendered. This left a gap on Gort's eastern flank between the British and the sea. The British were surprised by the Belgian capitulation. Although King Leopold had warned them in advance, as a constitutional monarch, Leopold's decision to surrender without consulting the Belgian government led to his condemnation by the Belgian and French Prime Ministers, Hubert Pierlot and Paul Reynaud. King George VI sent Gort a telegram that read, Gort sent the battle 1 3rd, 4th, and 50th divisions into the line to fill the space the Belgians had held. Defense of the perimeter German tank while they were still moving into position. They ran headlong into the German 256th division, who were trying to flank Gort. Armoured cars of the 12th Lancers stopped the Germans at Newport itself. A confused battle raged all along the perimeter throughout 28 May. Command control on the British side disintegrated, and the perimeter was driven slowly inwards toward Dunkirk. Meanwhile, Erwin Rommel had surrounded five divisions of the French 1st Army near Lille. Although completely cut off, the French fought on for four days under General Molinier, thereby keeping seven German divisions from the assault on Dunkirk, and saving an estimated 100,000 Allied troops. The defense of the perimeter held throughout 29 to 30 May, with the Allies falling back by degrees. On 31 May the Germans nearly punched through at Newport and the situation grew so desperate that two British battalion commanders had to personally man a Bren gun, with one colonel firing and the other loading. A few hours later, the 2nd Battalion, Coldstream Guards, of the 3rd Division, rushed to reinforce the line near Ferns, where the British troops had been routed. The guards restored order by shooting some of the fleeing troops, and turning others around. At Bayonet Point, the British troops returned to the line, and the German assault was beaten back. In the afternoon of the same day, the Germans breached the perimeter near the canal at Bullskamp, but the boggy ground on the far side of the canal, with sporadic fire from the Durham Light Infantry, halted them. As night fell, the Germans massed for another attack at Newport. 18 RAF bombers found the Germans while they were still assembling, and scattered them with an accurate bombing run. Retreat to Dunkirk 
Also on 31 May, General von Kuchler assumed command of all the German forces at Dunkirk. His plan was simple. He would launch an all-out attack across the whole front at 11 o'clock on 1 June. Strangely, von Kuchler ignored a radio intercept telling him the British were abandoning the eastern end of the line to fall back to Dunkirk itself. The morning of 1 June was clear good flying weather. In contrast to the bad weather that had hindered airborne operations on 30 and 31 May, although Churchill had promised the French that the British would cover their escape, on the ground it was the French who held the line while the last remaining British soldiers were evacuated, enduring concentrated German artillery fire and Luftwaffe strafing and bombs. The French stood their ground. On 2 June, the French began to fall back slowly, and by 3 June the Germans were about two miles from Dunkirk. The night of 3 June was the last night of evacuations. At 10.20 on 4 June, the Germans hoisted the swastika over the docks from which so many British and French troops had escaped under their noses. The desperate resistance of Allied forces especially the French 12th Motorized Infantry Division from the Fort Days Dunes, bought time for the evacuation of the bulk of the troops. The Wehrmacht captured some 35,000 soldiers, almost all of them French. These men had protected the evacuation until the last moment and were unable to embark. The same fate was reserved for the survivors of the French 12th Motorized Infantry Division. They were taken prisoner on the morning of 4 June on the beach of Malo Les Baines. The flag of this regiment was burnt so as not to fall into the hands of the enemy. Evacuation The War Office made the decision to evacuate British forces on 25 May. In the nine days from 27 May 4 June, 338,226 men escaped, including 139,997 French, Polish, and Belgian troops, together with a small number of Dutch soldiers, aboard 861 vessels. The historian Basil Littlehart says British Fighter Command lost 106 aircraft dogfighting over. Dunkirk, the Luftwaffe lost about 135 some of which were shot down by the French Navy and the Royal Navy, but MacDonald says the British lost 177 aircraft and the Germans lost 240. The docks at Dunkirk were too badly damaged to be used but the east and west moles were intact. Captain William Tennant, in charge of the evacuation, decided to use the beaches and the East Mole to land the ships. This highly successful idea hugely increased the number of troops that could be embarked each day. And indeed at the rescue operation's peak, on 31 May, over 68,000 men were taken off. The last of the British Army left on 3 June, and at 10.50, Tennant signalled Ramsey to say, Operation completed. Returning to Dover, however, Churchill insisted on coming back for the French. So the Royal Navy returned on 4 June in an attempt to rescue as many as possible of the French rearguard. Over 26,000 French soldiers were evacuated on that last day, but between 30,000 and 40,000 more were left behind and forced to surrender to the Germans. Aftermath Following the events at Dunkirk, the German forces regrouped before commencing an operation called Fall Rot, a renewed assault southward, starting on 5 June. Although two fresh British divisions had begun moving to France in an attempt to form a second BEF, the decision was taken on 14 June to withdraw all the remaining British troops, an evacuation called Operation Ariel, by 25 June. 
Almost 192,000 Allied personnel, 144,000 of them British, had been evacuated through various French ports. Although the French army fought on, German troops entered Paris on 14 June. The French government was forced to negotiate an armistice at Compiègne on the 22nd of June. The loss of materiel on the beaches was huge. The British army left enough equipment behind to equip about eight to ten divisions. Discarded in France were, among huge supplies of ammunition, 880 field guns. 310 guns of large caliber, some 500 anti-aircraft guns, about 850 anti-tank guns, 11,000 machine guns, nearly 700 tanks, 20,000 motorcycles, and 45,000 motor cars and lorries. Army equipment available at home was only just sufficient to equip two divisions. The British Army needed months to resupply properly, and some planned introductions of new equipment were halted while industrial resources concentrated on making good the losses. Officers told troops falling back from Dunkirk to burn, or otherwise disable their trucks. The shortage of army vehicles after Dunkirk was so severe that the Royal Army Service Corps was reduced to retrieving and refurbishing numbers of obsolete buses and coaches from British scrapyards to press them into use as troop transports. Some of these antique workhorses were still in use as late as the North African Campaign of 1942. The Dean of St Paul's, Walter Matthews, was the first to call the evacuation the Miracle of Dunkirk, a marble memorial to the battle stands. At Dunkirk, the French inscription is translated as, to the glorious memory of the pilots, mariners and soldiers of the French, and allied armies who sacrificed themselves in the Battle of Dunkirk. May to June 1940. The missing dead of the BEF are commemorated on the Dunkirk Memorial. Dunkirk Spirit British propaganda later exploited the successful evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940, and particularly the role of the Dunkirk Little Ships very effectively. Many of them were private vessels such as fishing boats and pleasure cruises, but commercial vessels such as ferries also contributed to the force, including a number from as far away as the Isle of Man and Glasgow. These smaller vessels, guided by naval craft across the channel from the Thames estuary and from Dover, assisted in the official evacuation, being able to move closer into the beachfront shallows than larger craft. The little ships acted as shuttles to and from the larger ships, lifting troops who were queuing in the water and many waiting shoulder deep in water for hours. The term, Dunkirk spirit, refers to the solidarity of the British people in times of adversity. Dunkirk Medal A commemorative medal was established in 1960 by the French National Association of Veterans of the Fortified Sector of Flanders in Dunkirk on behalf of the town of Dunkirk. The medal was initially awarded only to the French defenders of Dunkirk, but in 1970 the qualification was expanded to include British forces who served in the Dunkirk sector and the rescue forces, including the civilians who volunteered to man the little ships. The design of the bronze medal included the arms of the town of Dunkirk with Dunkirk 1940 on the reverse. Bibliography Aachen, Ronald, Pillar of Fire, Dunkirk 1940, Edinburgh, Berlin Limited, 1990, Bond, Brian, Britain, France and Belgium 1939-1940, London, Brassies, 1990, Butler, J.R.M. Ed. The War in France and Flanders 1939-1940, Official Campaign History
Uckfield, UK, Naval and Military Press Limited, 2009. Freezer, Carl Hines. The Blitzkrieg Legend, The 1940 Campaign in the West. Annapolis, Maryland, Naval Institute Press. 2005. Holmes, Richard, ed. France, Fall of. The Oxford Companion to Military History. New York, Oxford University Press, 2001. Houghton, E.R. Luftwaffe War, Blitzkrieg in the West. London, Chevron, Ian Allen, 2007. Keegan, John. The Second World War. New York, Viking Penguin. 1989. Kershaw, Ian. Fateful Choices, Ten Decisions That Changed the World, 1941 London, Penguin Books, 2008. Kilzer, Lewis. Hitler's Traitor, Martin Bormann. And the Defeat of the Reich. New York, Presidio Press, 2000. Little Heart, B.H. History of the Second World War. New York, G. P. Putnam, 1970. Lord, Walter. The Miracle of Dunkirk. New York, The Viking Press, 1982. London, Alan Lane, 1983. Citations from the Wordsworth Military Library reprint of 1998. MacDonald, John. Great Battles of World War II. Toronto, Canada, Strathern Books Limited, 1986. McEwen, Ian. Atonement. London, Jonathan Cape, 2001. McGlashan, Kenneth B. with Owen P's Up. Down. To Earth, a fighter pilot recounts his experiences of Dunkirk, the Battle of Britain, Dieppe, D-Day and beyond. London, Grub Street Publishing, 2007. Murray, Willemson. Strategy for Defeat, The Luftwaffe 1935-1945. Princeton, New Jersey, University Press of the Pacific, 2002. Murray, Williamson and Alan R. Millett. A War to Be Won, Fighting the Second World War. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Belknap Press, 2000. Post and Michael M. History of the Second World War, British War Production, London, HMSO, 1952. Salmaggi, Cesare and Alfredo Pallavicini. 2194 Days of War, an illustrated chronology of the Second World War. New York, Gallery Books. 1993. Sabag Montefiore, Hugh. Dunkirk, Fight of the Last Man. London, Penguin Books, 2006. Shira, William L. The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, A History of Nazi Germany. New York, Simon & Schuster, 1959. Taylor, AJP and S. L. Mayer, eds. A History of World War II. London, Octopus Books, 1974. Thomas, Nick. Raf Top Gun, Teddy Donaldson, CB, DSO, AFC and Bar, Battle of Britain Ace. And World Air Speed Record Holder. London, Pen and Sword, 2008. Thompson, Major General Julian. Dunkirk, Retreat to Victory. London, Pan Books, 2009. Weinberg, Gerhard L.A. World at Arms. New York, Cambridge University Press, 1994. Wilmot, Chester. The Struggle for Europe. Old Saybrook, Connecticut, Konecki and Konecki, 1952. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.